This is Ray Moss Holder with Taylor Caldwell's Dear and Glorious Physician. I want you to guess, as this continues, what event was taking place that caused panic in these same people who were so peaceful? Uh, you tell me. Or in fact, I'll tell you at the end. Deal? Chapter 40. Lucanus returned to Athens. It was a warm day in the early spring, and even this dry and astringent air had a liveliness and had a gaiety. The women who sold flowers sat in their stalls with small mountains of laurel, violets, little roses, anemones, and poppies before them. They called out in rockish voices. The streets streamed with life. It was never very cold here, yet when the spring came, with blossoms and with a bright blue air, that people became vehement with a kind of joy and pleasure. The little shops rang with bargainers. There was the smell of cooking sausages and garlic everywhere. Children ran and shouted and wrestled in the gutters. Old men smiled at each other, lifted aside their beards and talked in learned voices. The hills had freshened into a pure green upon the Acropolis. The Parthenon was a crown of frozen light. The mighty statue of Athena leaned against the sky. Everywhere there was a quickening, a sense of anticipation. Young girls and young men strolled hand in hand, smiling. Babies laughed from their mother's arms. The Roman soldiers leaned against the walls of buildings. Jan grinned and scratched their chins as they looked eagerly at the women. The horses drawing chariots pranced. Dogs barked. Lawyers and businessmen had stopped their bustling. They walked easily and forgot to discuss their problems. The Canis knew that this was the beginning of the Jewish Passover. There was a synagogue nearby, but he shunned it. He had the feeling that he was scuttling his head bent as if fleeing from something. But this was ridiculous. He'd landed at midnight and had gone to his lonely little house. He had several old patients to visit, and he would do that in the morning. He was not one to walk casually for the pleasure of it, and he didn't know why he had been drawn to walk the city today. But there was a thirst in him now for the sight of his fellow men and he could not have enough of seeing. I'm not young, he thought. I've not been one to mingle with others or enjoy their company. What ails me? He smiled at an old flower woman and bought a small bouquet of little white lilies from her. He walked on and buried his nose in the flowers and the fragrance almost overwhelmed him. He decided to return to his house and write long overdue letters to his family. The garden was quiet and full of sun. There had been a wind earlier, but now it had fallen. Everything had a patina of light such as he had never seen before. Each tender leaf was plated with it each flower was drowned in it. 
the fountains sparkled with it. Each grain of earth was illuminated. The walls of the little house shone as if polished. Lucanus looked at the sky. Never had it been clearer or more brilliant. Not a cloud stood in it. He ate his small and frugal meal. He drank his wine. He listened to the silence of his house. It was as if something had drawn a mighty breath and was holding it. Nothing stirred. Now everything reflected radiance, even his plain silver goblet, even his fork and his spoon, even the sides of his hands, even his scrubbed white wooden floor. His eyes began to sting with such light. He felt an overpowering weariness and thought, I'll lie down and rest. He lay down and shut his eyes. He hoped to sleep during the afternoon heat, but there was glaring an insistence behind his eyelids. He felt himself beginning to sweat. His whole body felt a stretching, an agony. He couldn't rest. He got to his feet and he was very weak. Is this the fever again? He asked himself with alarm, thinking of the patients he'd have to visit tomorrow and the throngs which would gather at his door. He couldn't feel them. They waited for him. He stumbled about the house, that awful flood of light, until he found his pouch. His groping hand reached to the bottom and closed on something cool and metallic, and he brought out the cross which Kepta had given Rubria and which she had given to him. He looked at it in his palm. It glittered blindingly as if fired from the sun, and now it burned his flesh. Blinking, he put the cross down and stared at it. And all his dreams, all that he had heard returned to him in one thunderous clamor. But what had this cross to do with a miserable Jewish teacher in distant Israel, who it was claimed raised the dead, performed miracles, and brought multitudes about him. What had this cross of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, to do with one so far away and one so humble and unknown to the world of men? There was no rest in this house. There was no rest anywhere for one so beset and so besieged and so desolate. Lucanus went into the garden panting for shade, but there was no shade, no protection from the sun. Everything stood in shadowless light, affixed in flaming crystal. Then all at once, a darkness fell on the face of the earth, swallowing all light, extinguishing it, 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 driving it before it like a tide and banishing it. Ah, thought Luca Canis, there will be a storm, a cooling storm. He looked at the sky, the very dark sky. An enormous earthquake occurred at this hour in Nicaea. In the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad, Phlegon wrote that a great darkness occurred over all of Europe, which was an inexplicable thing to the astronomers. The records of Rome, according to 
Tertullian made a note of complete and universal darkness, which frightened the Senate, then meeting and threw the city into an anxious turmoil, for there was no storm and no clouds. The records of Grecian and Egyptian astronomers show that the darkness was so intense for a while that even they, skeptical men of science, were alarmed. People streamed in panic through the streets of every city, and birds went to rest, and cattle returned to their paddocks. But there was no note of an eclipse. No eclipse was expected. It was a, as if the sun had retreated through space and had been lost. Mayan and Inca records also show this phenomenon, allowing for the difference in time. Where was the sun? He stared at the black sky, searching. Everything was very still. No cricket lifted its voice. The birds were silent, though they had been murmurous all morning. Lucanus looked at the city. The Parthenon was a faint outline of pure silver. The city was in darkness. Then he heard a distant and muffled sound, as if from a sea, and he knew it was the voice of the city, full of panic and questioning. He ran to his gate. The road that passed it was empty. He looked beyond the road and dimly saw cattle lying down in the grass as if sleeping. The air was as clear as water and as limpid and as cool. So thought Lucanus, this is no dust storm. He sat down on a bench and felt a coldness as of death running over his body. He remembered old myths of the wrath of the gods. There would be a day when the gods, sickened by men, would withdraw the sun and plunge the earth into everlasting darkness and death. He moved his body restlessly. He stood up and walked around and around the garden. A scent of roses and lilies rose on the air, as if they'd been crushed under a giant foot. The city began to shine and twinkle with hastily lit lanterns and torches. Lucanus knew that most probably a huge river of humanity would now begin to pour up toward the Parthenon, there to beseech the gods to lift this terrible and inexplicable darkness from the world. As for himself, he wasn't consumed not with anxiety for himself, but he was with a passionate questioning. As one who had been taught by the greatest scientists in the world, he began to conjecture. It was believed that one day the sun would burn itself out, and this planet Earth would roll through space, gathering ice, and deathly cold, and all life would die on it. But that, the astronomers had said, would take ages. The sun would slowly die, would redden, would wink out like a cinder. It would occur over eons, would never occur instantaneously. But this had occurred in a twinkling between one breath and another. Lucanus searched for the sun, the retreating sun, again. 
Was it possible that it had hurled itself away from his children to join his radiant brothers? An enormous sense of excitement suddenly swept over him and also a terror he had never known before. Where among those burning constellations was the sun now? What chaos was it causing among the orderly brotherhood? This intruder from a corner of the universe. What planets was it devouring in its flaming passage? Then he felt he wasn't alone. He peered about him in the moonlight and the starlight. Were there pale shadows moving about him in the garden? Or only the illusion of his strained eyes? His heart leaped. Shadows paused near him. And he thought he saw the faces of Rubria and Kepta and Sarah smiling dimly. They drifted on like snow, and there surely was Diodorus, young and strong and valorous, his hand lifted in greeting. There was Joseph Ben Gamaliel. Oh, this was mad, with a tender glance. There among many shades of the, were the women he had Succored stood Aurelia, animated and smiling. A multitude passed him, passed, paused before him, hailing him in silence and with affection. He shook his head violently and gasped and closed his eyes. Then the earth lifted, as if on a wave shivered, trembled, and slid under his feet. A deep rumble muttered up from its bowels. A wind rose like a hurricane, then fell as swiftly, then rose again, howling, so that Lucana's breath was smothered in his throat. Now he was no longer physician, philosopher, or scientist. He was a man, and he was overpowered by fear. He stood up and shook, and his teeth rattled. He walked about the garden, which was ghostly. His flesh quivered as if in an egg. He went to the fountain and heard his leaping waters. He went into the house. There he forced himself to light a lamp. He stood and stared at it blankly. He picked up a book and put it down. His head throbbed. In a moment, he tried to speak reasonably to himself. He remembered the astronomy he had studied. The sun couldn't detach itself from the wanderers, its children, the planets. Where it went, the planets went also. Certainly, certainly, he said aloud, that the heavy silence about him and nodded his head as if satisfied. But he knew this was an idiot's reflection. The sun was gone. The sky was very dark above. All man's reasons, his most profound reflections couldn't alter these facts. For once, he couldn't attach a name, a theory, to what was impenetrable. He couldn't adjust what was not known to what he knew. Nevertheless, Lucanus' mind flew out like a distracted bird feverishly attempting to explain what couldn't be explained. Again the earth thundered under his feet, and a long moaning poured into the cool air. 
had the world tilted behind another planet? Thousand solutions whirled in his mind, and he rejected them at once as absurd. And then for the first time, he thought of his family in Rome with a tremor. He thought of Priscus in Jerusalem. If the world was being destroyed inexorably and mysteriously, then all men must die together. Panic, selfishness, fear, terror, anxiety, love, all these could accomplish nothing, couldn't fling off the cold hand of fate. He lit another lamp, then another, till his house was full of light. He sat down and stared before him. He came to himself with a start, conscious that he had fallen into, it, into a sick sleep, overwhelmed by the awful thing that had come upon the world. <clears throat> his lamps were flickering low. He got to his feet to refill them. Then he noticed that a gray light stood at his doors and windows like a dawn. He ran into the garden again. The light became stronger, but very slowly. The earth no longer slipped and quivered and rumbled. It was steadfast. Lucanus looked at the sky. A vast rosiness hung there, as if a sunset were spreading from horizon to horizon. The earth lost its ghostliness. Color flooded back moment by moment. The birds cheeped or chattered excitedly in the trees. The fountains sang louder as if relieved. The voice of the city reached Lucanus. It was a sound of rejoicing, but it had a hysterical overtone. Then the rosy hue parted like a curtain, and the sun leaped into the sky like a warrior with a golden shield. Lucanus breathed deeply. Never had the world, no, not even when he had been a child, looked so fair to him, so dear, so precious, now that it had been delivered from death. And from death it had surely been delivered as a bird is released from an enraged and imminent hand. The foundations of the earth had been shaken. The sun had been lost. But now the terror and the anger had departed and a sweetness rose from the flowers and the grass as if the earth had exhaled a breath too long held in fright. Lucanus pressed his fingers over his face and sighed deeply. Certainly, he thought, now there is a scientific explanation for this, because I don't know the cause of this phenomenon doesn't mean that it's beyond explanation. It was late afternoon. He was hungry. He sat down and ate a small meal and never had wine tasted so delightful and never had bread and cheese had this flavor before. He wrote letters and one was to an astronomer in Alexandria commenting on the darkness, asking if it had been observed there and what the cause was and if it was likely to happen again. When he slept that night, it was as if he had been reprieved. And with that reprieve had come not only a pardon, but life and peace and tranquility like the first day the world had ever known. 
and man was born anew. Chapter 41 Dozens of the patients who came to Lucanus the next day were new to him. They were suffering from shock, were very pale, some were almost speechless. He reassured them smilingly that nothing that couldn't be explained by learned men had occurred the day before. Very possibly it was an eclipse. Only children were frightened by them. Had not the Egyptian astronomers long ago been able to predict eclipses, not only for the immediate future, but for ages not yet even conceived? One must trust the wise, the men who understood, who could chart the heavens, the phases of the moon, the movement of the stars, exactly. Lucanus, as well as patients, crowded him, demonstrated an eclipse with an apple and a nut. They were very interested. They followed his demonstration with open mouths and widened eyes. And as he had done yesterday, they nodded their heads wisely at each other and declared that they had known this all the time. They are no more learned than I, thought Lucanus with some wryness. It's all very well, said an old man, shaking his head, looking shrewdly at the physician. But you've explained nothing. This is beyond the explanations of man. The others laughed at him merrily, called him graybeard, but Lucanus didn't laugh. The old man's strong and piercing eyes transfixed him. He said, well, look, let us look at your, rheum your rheumatic ankles again, my friend. I have a new salve, which I believe will help you. I hoped yesterday, said the old man, that it was the end of the world. For we're not, are we not all wicked people, an insult to heaven? The others laughed at him even louder but they glanced at him with some malevolence. Men meditated, Lucanus did not enjoy being called evil, an affront to the gods. And let the man beware who told them the truth. There was only one other wealthy family in Athens besides that of Turbo, which Lucanus treated. The name of the father was Cleon, and he boasted that he was descended from the leather family famous at the time of Pericles. He and his wife and widowed daughter lived in a splendid villa near the Acropolis, whose gardens were surrounded by high gates and patrolled by slaves armed with swords or scimitars in the eastern fashion. Lucanus liked none of the family, but Cleon had an obscure disease which interested the physician. Periodically he broke out in enormous hives, which became livid, turned slightly pale after a few days, then erupted into hideous boils. Lucanus had seen nothing like this before. He was writing a treatise on it. It eliminated the usual sources of the hives as a cause. The man's diet had been reduced stringently. As he was a man of evil temper, and his wife no less so, and his reputation foul as a usurer, he was hated by all who knew him including Lucanus. The physician was beginning to formulate a theory 
that the man's own temperament was the cause of the outbreakings. His flesh was pitted like old stone, and one eye had been permanently injured. It was not new that vicious humors of the mind could strike somatically, but this was an extraordinary demonstration which intrigued Lucanus. He went that afternoon to the luxurious mansion of Cleon, invariably charged the old man a large fee, but he invariably gave him some temporary relief. He was admitted at once to be to the immured rooms in which Cleon spent his tormented days. The hives had arrived a week ago. They were already separating. Lucanus dressed the boils, while Cleon complained and winced and cursed. He was a tiny man with a bloated body, a squint where he had suffered the eye injury, and a little face as riddled and folded as a nut. After you were here last year, my good Lucanus, I had sussies for many weeks, and I thought I was cured. Had you not arrived now, I am sure I should have died within a few days. He showed Lucanus a new hive on one of his buttocks, but it was as big as a man's fist and tumid. Lucanus spread some ointment on it after bathing it in very cold water. You do not come often enough, said the old man angrily. I've added a new physician in my household, but he's no better than the others. I've had to have him flogged on numerous occasions, for he's a violent and blasphemous mouth when he is aroused, though for the rest he's a sullen wretch and of a cold, withdrawing temper. And what did he say to you? asked Lucanus abstractedly. Within a few days the hive would degenerate into a formidable boil, which would have to be lanced. The old man sprang up in his bed and shook his fist. When these hives occurred this last time, I called him in and he examined me. Then he said, he dared to say the dog, that it was not my flesh that was ailing, but my spirit. I should have sent him to prison or flogged him to death or sold him to the galleys. But I, I had paid too much money for him. Lucanus lifted his head alertly. A physician, a new physician. The man had considerable astuteness then. I bought him in the marketplace for a fine sum, I can tell you. He's reputed to have been educated at Tarsus, but I'll wager that he received what little learning he has from a midwife and a butcher. You know what happened yesterday when the sun disappeared? You'll understand I'm not an ignorant man. I was aware that it was an eclipse. I heard my wife and daughter wailing, the slaves had fled into the cellars. Then this wrestle, the, this new physician of mine, came into my chamber and looked at me with my eyes like fire. And he said nothing. Billy stood for a long while and gazed at me until I thought I should go mad. Ah, when I am well again, I shall put him on the block for any use, preferably, of course, as a minor. He lay back on his cushions and gave Lucanus 
his best imitation of an agreeable smile. Ah, oh, the pain is already subsiding, my Lucanus. I'm so grateful to you. Lucanus gave the attendant slaves a jar of ointment and instructed them to use it every two hours, day and night. He then walked into the hall and beckoned to the overseer. I should like to talk to the new slave, he said. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me do it again. I should like to talk to the new slave, he said in a low voice. I think I can give the physician some instructions concerning treatment when I'm not here. What's his name? His name is Samos. For it is said he was born there, master, said the overseer respectively. He is a surly dog. No doubt he was once a thief, for he's branded most unpleasantly. He called for wine for Lucanus, who sat in a comfortable chair in the sun-filled hall, and then sent for Samos. The slave returned with a tall, dark young man of a broad but distinguished face, somewhat long black hair and deep blue eyes, strong wide shoulders and the bearing of a king. He walked toward Lucanus silently and his movements were stately. Then as he stood before Lucanus, he raised his hand and lifted the hair from his forehead and contemptuously showed his brand was dark purple and knotted and repellent. Then he dropped his hair over it again and said sullenly, What will you have with me? Pity surged through Lucanus. He asked the overseer to leave. Then he motioned to Samos to sit beside him. But Samos said in his bitter voice, No. I am only a slave, and I've always been a slave. Do not be magnanimous to me. I want no man's friendship, no man's kindness, and every man's enemy. So, said Lucinus, smiling a little through his compassion, increasing. Then, Stand before me like a slave, if that's all you believe you are. As a fellow physician, I wish to ask you some questions. He paused and added in a lower voice, I believe you're quite correct in your diagnosis of Cleon's hives and boils. Sema's face changed. His white and sensitive mouth moved, and his large blue eyes blinked as if suppressing tears. He wasn't old. Lucanus guessed him to be not more than 22. The young man hesitated, then with a muttered oath, he jerked a chair forward and sat near Lucanus and glared at him. I am correct, but what can a man do with one such as Cleon, except to call in the priests and have them exorcise his demon, unless he is a demon himself? Lucanus laughed softly. Who knows? But tell me, were you truly educated at Tarsus? Samos looked aside. His profile was strong and classical, with fine planings about his cheeks, and with an excellent chin. Lucanus felt a tug at himself 
the younger physician reminded him vaguely of someone and the remembrance was a hurt. Then Samo said, I was born in a certain household in Samos. They had a fine physician there. I followed him about and finally I was his assistant. He was becoming old. He recommended to my master was almost as cruel and vicious as this Cleon and a merchant of the world that I be sent to Tarsus. So I was. I spent three years there, was graduated with laurel leaves, and my teachers were all gentle, good men. And those years were all the happiness I ever knew. A tear slipped along his eyelids, and he blinked furiously, drew out a handkerchief from his belt, and blew his nose. Then he stared dully at the polished white floor. While I was in Tarsus, I knew I could no longer be a slave. I must be free or I must die. So I told one of my teachers, but he counseled patience. Physicians did not kill themselves. If I learned enough in gifts from my master, I might eventually buy my freedom. But he didn't know my master who was less generous than Midas. I received no gifts, nor expected any. After a year, I ran away. He paused and caught his breath. I was captured and sent back. I expected death, or at the very best, to be sent to the galleys. But my master had spent much money on me, so he had me branded. Then I became like a wild wolf, he said, and he sold me. So I came to this household, which is like his. Lucanus regarded him with a compassion which was as vivid as physical, physically plain. He slid, would you like to be with me? Would you wish me to purchase you? If I'm successful, I'll free you, asking only that you be my companion. Because I'll tell you why, I'm lonely and I have no friends. Samo started. He swung on his buttocks to Lucanus with an incredulous smile, an expression that was separate to himself. He saw the physician's beaming blue eyes, his gentle smile, his graying golden hair, and he knew that Lucanus wasn't jesting. He uttered a faint choke cry and fell before the other men and laid his head mutely on his knees. Then he began to weep, not with tears, but with the dry sobbing of a man who facing death has been promised life. He wound his arms about Lucanus' waist and clung to him speechless. Lucanus put his hand on the head and on his Lucanus put his hand on the head on his knee. The hair of Samos was as fine as silk and very thick and slightly curling. Lucanus sighed and let him remain at his feet, clinging to him like a child till he was more controlled. Then he said with the utmost gentleness, gentleness, remain here while I talk with Cleon and pray. He loosened the clutching arms, which were smooth and yet muscular, and went back to the chamber of Cleon. Cleon was half asleep, 
having been relieved of his suffering, but when he saw Lucanus, he raised his head from the cushions. Ah, what a treasure you are, my Lucanus. I haven't slept for many nights. And now I'm as a child in a soft cradle. Well, I wish to examine that a hive on your buttocks just once more, said Lucanus, and pretended to be freshly interested. It is subsiding. It's very possible that it won't separate. This is a difficult place to have such an infliction. It can extend dangerously. He sat down and regarded Cleon with an expression he hoped was kindly. I'm, I've been talking with your slave Samos. I believe you've been robbed. That is, this young man can never do anything for you or for your family. Cleon screamed with wrath and beat his clenched fist on his cushions. I knew it! Curse me that merchant, that foul vulture! I should never have trusted him. He has a very bad reputation. Ha! Huh? A sell Samos to the galleys! He sucked on his toothless gums, and his eyes glittered with pleasure. It would be happiness to me. Thinking of him there. <laughs> uh, but I've been robbed, plundered. What shall be my vengeance? He leaned toward Lucanus cunningly. Can you not give me a letter saying that the wretches attempted to poison me? Then I can have him executed. <laughs> a bead of saliva appeared at the corner of his mouth, and he licked it. Lucanus pretended to consider this judiciously. Then he shook his head. You know, it comes to me that I need a household slave. Will you sell him to me? He's very proud and arrogant. Cleon's hard and piercing eyes searched his face. He lay back, grumbling. Well, now, he cost me a pretty penny. The king has nodded. One can sympathize with you, Cleon. What'd you pay for him? The crafty eyes narrowed. Cleon knew all about the Venus, knew all the gossip of the city. This fool of a clever physician was a rich man. If he were mad enough to treat the rabble for nothing and so acquire a godlike reputation, then he should pay for both his madness and his reputation. So Cleon named an outrageous sum beyond Lucanus' immediate resources. Lucanus was both angry and concerned. Why, well, that's the price of the most dexterous physician beyond all price. It is the ransom of a prince. Cleon shrugged. He was again sleepy. Then I will keep him with pleasure. Shall order him flogged every day in this chamber so I can delight in this scene. The Canis knew his obstinacy he stood up. If you don't tell Samos to me, I'll never return again, and you will die. I mean this, Cleon. Cleon opened his eyes in fright. You wouldn't abandon an old man. I will. Make up your mind. I have no doubt you paid highly for Samos, but not what you've stated. I offer you now, and for the last time, 300 gold sestries, freshly minted. Take it or find yourself another physician. 
You would condemn me to death? Yes. What do you want, same as that dog? Why do you want him? I have told you. He's taken my fancy. I've broken wild horses in my youth. Cleon paused, gasping in fury and spite. He wished Lucanus were a slave. He'd have him flogged regularly. He'd have him branded with hot irons until his flesh sizzled. He screamed, Give me the money! And may he cut it. Hunt your dreams! Lucina smiled. Withdraw your curse, or I'll be unable to return to you tomorrow for further treatment. He tossed a purse on the bed. And now you'll sign a bill of sale to me. A few minutes later, he returned to the hall where Samos was waiting for him. Samus looked at him with wild blue eyes, his lips working desperately. Lucanus took his arm. Come home with me, he said as he said to Ramos long ago. Lucanus placed all the lamps he had on his table, on which he had laid his sharp and shining instruments. Samus sat in a chair beside the table, rigid, and waiting, his eyes fixed with love and devotion on the other man. Lucanus mixed a potion and a goblet of wine and held it out to Samos. This will relieve your pain. I don't know how successful I'll be in diminishing this terrible brand, but I'll do my best. You will succeed, dear master. Don't. Call me master, call me by my name. I will remain with you always, whether you give me my freedom or not, Lucanus. I'll take you to the Roman Praetor tomorrow and you'll have your freedom. Now you may not like my life. You're young and in the proud set of your face I see ambition, swear no oaths, which you may regret. Lucina smiled and still extended the goblet. How could I ever, ever regret? Demanded Samos passionately that you have taken me to your house as a, as a friend, the only friend I ever knew, that you have offered to free me. I who prefer to die rather than be a slave. I ask only that I serve you forever. Still, you're young, you're an excellent physician. The world will be yours. As a free man, you'll be a citizen of Rome. Fortune could come into your hands. But first, before all this shining future, and I shan't hold you to your promise. The brand must be removed. Drink this at once. Samos, his hand shaking, took the goblet. He stared into the murky depths. Opium, he murmured. He looked into look in his eyes and slowly put the goblet on the table and drew a deep breath. No, Lucanus studied his face, then he nodded. It's painful to become a slave, but it's more painful to become free. I understand you prefer to take your freedom with suffering, for it will cleanse your heart. However, I warn you that this will be agonizing. Samos gripped the sides of the chair and raised his face. I'm ready, he said. Close your eyes so the blood won't drip into them. Lucanus lifted a narrow keen blade. He must work fast. He examined the brand again. 
ugly though it was. It was not an old scar. The skin was still tender about it and flexible, for Samos was young. He would remove the brand carefully, not injuring underlying tissues, and would draw the clean edges together. And when the wounded, when the wounded healed, there would only be a long, thin wrinkle from the hairline to the brows, and in a few months it would whiten and be hardly noticed. Lucanus explained what he was about to do, and Samos nodded. His mouth had paled in anticipation, and he had become rigid. Lucanus drew the blade from the top to the bottom with the delicate touch, and the scar opened like a mouth and bled. But there were no large blood vessels underneath. Samos didn't wince. He was very still. Lucanus wiped away the dripping blood and carved out the brand. Samos turned as white as death. His knuckles rose on his gripping hands, but he didn't move. Lucanus began to sweat in his vast, vast urgency. Tears of blood ran from the wound and rolled in red drops down Samo's cheeks. Some gathered in little puddles in the corners of his mouth. The lamps flickered and blew in a light wind from the window. The physician, concerned over the pain he was inflicting, glanced at Samos' taut face for an instant. Again, that sensation of familiarity came to him. You're very brave, he said, and his voice shook. You're, you're a brave and noble man, Samos. The brand lay in a little saucer as evil as a demon's eye, and already shriveling. Lucanus took up his linen thread and needle. Samos had a look of exhaustion about him. Lucanus wished he would faint, but the proud expression about the younger man's mouth didn't slacken. Lucanus began to sew deftly and he talked in a soothing voice of the work he did among the poor and the odd cases he had encountered. Samos smiled faintly. The young, smooth skin had to be stretched to meet together, the scar oozing little drops of blood slowly closed, and it was done. Open your eyes, Samus, said Lucanus, fell into a chair and wiped away a sweat with the back of his hand. Samus opened his eyes and smiled at him with joy and pride. And after a moment, Lucanus bandaged the wound, which no longer bled. Ah, uh, I'm pleased with this. It'll be better than I hoped. But now you must drink a goblet of wine with me, for, man, I'm undone. Laughing in a trembling voice, he poured two glasses of wine. Samos reached for one with his left hand. Lucanus put the goblet into that hand, then stopped abruptly. His heart almost seemed to stop, and there was a roaring in his ears. His face became whiter and stiller than the face of Samos. Samos looked at him and was startled. Lucanus, he exclaimed, this has been too much for you. You appear ready to collapse. He got to his feet, wavering, put his arm about Lucanus' shoulder. 
looking his mouth open silently. Then he gasped. His eyes swelled with tears. He rose and stood beside Samos, tried to speak, and he could only croak. Then he looked at Samos and said in the very quietest voice, you are not Samos. That's not your name. Your name is Aria ben Elazar. And you are a Jew. And I've been searching for you for 20 years. He lifted the astounded young man's left hand and raised it to the light. The little finger was very crooked and bent sharply inwards towards the other fingers. And Lucanus looked into Arya's eyes and saw the eyes of Sarah and burst into smothered weeping. Oh, God is good. Above all things, God is good. Chapter 42. Lucanus wrote at once to Sarah Basilizar's lawyers in Jerusalem. He said to Aria, You must leave on the next ship, which will arrive after my letter has reached the lawyers. I would accompany you, for this is a very dear thing to me, but I have a contract for two months on another ship, and I can't break my word, but I'll join you in Jerusalem later. Perhaps. But Aria said to him, Do not ask me to leave you. I've not had much experience. Let me be your assistant for those two months. Lucanus smiled. He knew that Aria had made this excuse in order not to be separated from him. So Lucanus agreed and Aria walking with a high, quick step of a released youth, went with him. Then Lucanus, who felt as if some awful abscess had been finally lanced in him and purified, began to teach Aria his ancient religion in the watches of the night. Aria had been indifferently educated in Greco-Roman religion in the home of his first master and then in Tarsus by his teachers. He listened to Lucanus with the deepest attention and asked pertinent questions. It's strange to discover I'm a Jew, he said, once shaking his head. My masters hated the Jews. And, I, and call them avarice and cunning. They themselves, the most evil and greedy and crafty of men. My first master, in particular, could not sleep for his schemes. And I never saw him rejoice except when he had ruined another man. When Aria walked, Lucanus remembered what Eliezer ben Solomon had said of his son. He is a young lion. He questioned Aria about any memories he possessed. Aria frowned, trying to remember. Well, I was told I was born on Samos, and so was given that name. I was two years old when I was purchased to be a toy to my first master's children. I was bought from a block. That's all I know. I've had a dream which haunted all my childhood, which I sometimes dream of even now. I'm in a great and beautiful garden. I see white columns, but no statues, such as, uh, as I saw later in other houses. I see profusions of flowers everywhere and bright fountains. I have a little white dog, which is my very own. 
It's very lovely, very peaceful. A young man comes into the garden, tosses me in his arms and kisses me. There's a young girl too with dark flowing hair who plays with me. Rhea brushed his hand over his healing brow. Ah, the dream mingles. Was it the same day or another? I'm with you girls in the garden who romp with me. It was is very brilliant and very silent in the sun. My little dog isn't there and I miss him. All at once too dark. Almost naked men up here. I look at them without fear, though I don't recognize them as I recognize my guardians. They creep up on the girls. They raise something in their hands which flashes in the sun. The girls fall upon their faces. I laugh and clap my hands because I think it's a game. Then I'm seized by one of the men who move like shadows. A hand is put over my mouth and I begin to suffocate. I can't breathe. Then something black falls over my eyes. That's all I remember. My next memory is of this strange house and cruelty and blows. How much later that was, I don't know. It must be a dream. No, the kidness said, wasn't a dream. Reed developed <clears throat> an intense hunger to know all about his family, his father, his sister. Lucanus never tired of talking of Sarah. Once while he was speaking, he saw Rhea looking at him with an inscrutable expression. She was the loveliest of women and the sweetest and the kindest. He said in a voice he believed to be dispassionate. Lucanus patted Aria's shoulder affectionately. <laughs> I feel like a father. And in truth, you could be my son. Because I am not young. He was comforted. He painted a small picture of Sarah for Aria the fair face and candid eyes, and beautiful smile beamed like flesh from the wood, and the white neck was proud. She's like a divinity, said Aria. This made Lucanus laugh. Do not speak like a Greek or a Roman. Your countrymen will look at you with an umbrage and detestation if you call any human being a divinity. Let us sit down and study again of Moses and how he delivered his people from the Egyptians. I find the story fascinates you, and as the son of the Lizier ben Solomon, you must do better with your Hebrew lessons. An attachment grew up between them which was like the deep devotion of a man who only has one son, and his heart speaks to that son. Lucanus' mysterious sense of comfort and fulfillment increased day by day. It was as if all he had ever loved was embodied in a rail, whom he taught like a child. They were never weary of conversation. Lucanus, in speaking of his own life, lived it again as he told Aria of it. When they stopped at one port, a messenger came aboard to deliver a large bag of gold to Aria and joyful messages from the lawyers in Jerusalem. We await the arrival of the son of Elysia ben Solomon, they'd written. He'll be purified in the temple, 
and return to his people. Blessed is God that he has found you. Aria distributed the money among the members of the miserable crew. He went into the galleys and gave several of the slaves enough gold to purchase their freedom. For days and nights thereafter, the little ship rang with joyous cries and salutes to the gods. Sailors kissed the hands of Aria when he passed them, and he was embarrassed. Lucanus could speak fully and with love of God to Aria now. His spirit was liberated. He was like one who waits for a summons. He sure will come and waits serenely. He was frank with Aria and explained his earlier hatred for God. Yet all the time, I was secretly in Raged that he didn't manifest himself to me, but appeared to ignore me. I would defy him, and there was no answer. That was unpardonable. He told Aria all the he had been told by Kepta and Joseph and Gamliel. And when Lucanus spoke, so it was as if they believed the beloved teacher stood at those. Let me read that again. He told Aria all that he had been told by Kepta and Joseph ben Gamaliel. And when Lucanus spoke, so it was as if these beloved teachers stood at his elbow, smiling and nodding. He told Aria of the Jewish, Chaldean, Babylonian, and Egyptian prophecies. He told Aria of the strange Jewish teacher of whom Priscus had written and whom Ramus had said, but we hear no more of him. Once many stories came to me until two months ago. Since then, there has been only silence. I have questioned people in several ports, but receive only baffled smiles. I've written to my brother Priscus several times, asking for more news, but there is none. He has not written to me. Has he returned to Rome? I wrote my mother two days ago. We will find the Jewish rabbi in Jerusalem, said Aria, intensely interested. He invades my thoughts. Repeat to me again the prophecy of Isaiah. When they found a little Jewish synagogue in the ports of Lycanus, they would take Aria to it. But they couldn't penetrate beyond the court of the Gentiles. I understand that I cannot approach the Holy of Holies until I'm purified, said Aria, looking about him curiously. But why are the Gentiles forbidden to enter? God is God of all men. My people must be proud and, and an obdurate race. Had they not been so, they couldn't have survived the ages said Lucanus. A man must preserve what is best in him and his people. Still, as you say, God is God of all men. However, I'm mindful of the ceremonies in the temples of the Greeks and Romans and Egyptians. Only the priests, the elects, can partake of the mysteries. Only the priests drink the sacrificial wines and eat of the sacrificed animals. There are some things which must be kept from the vulgar and the stupid, for they can only corrupt. The ordained priests bless and perform their offices, but you must remember that they have been ordained. My people are a priestly people. 
and only they have commanded that men love one another and do justly to each other. Not as a matter of philosophy, but as an act of faith. It's a strange commandment. He looked at Lucanus with a stately lift of his head. He touched Lucanus on the shoulder with his hand. Yes, he has called you. A great storm arose one night, and the ship was forced to put into a little harbor, which was already crowded with ships, which had run before the bellowing of the wind and leaping of the waves. When the day dawned in fire, the sea was still tumultuous, and the battered ships weighed at anchor and were fearful of putting out again. Lucanus and Aria stood on the plunging deck of their vessel. And they saw that their nearest neighbor was a magnificent ship with fine wood. Its furled sails lay like heaps of burnished silk on the deck. The sailors were clad in good clothing and walked confidently. The captain apparently was a man of consequence though he was now pacing up and down with a worried expression, and the two friends could see him biting his lip. It's a private vessel, the toy of some very rich man, said Lucanus. He hailed the captain who came reluctantly to the railing of his ship, which was inlaid with ebony and pearl and gilt. Lucanus noticed that the ship had no figurehead of a woman or a mermaid. Is there something wrong aboard? Asked Lucanus in Greek. The captain shook his head. Lucanus tried Aramaic and the captain nodded eagerly. He replied, yes, sir, <coughs> there's something very wrong. My glorious master, the owner of this ship, lies ill in bed. A physician died last night this storm. He was thrown against a wall and his head was smashed. What ails your master? The captain sure his head. Who knows? He's lain like one stricken by mortal illness for more than two months. He's from Jerusalem. His physician was very renowned. Two months ago, my master took to his bed, weeping violently, and would see neither his wife nor his children, neither his mother nor his father. The physician was bewildered. Then my master said he would sail the seas to forget but he, what he's trying to forget, no one knows. He hasn't moved from his bed. He is dying moment by moment. And he wrings his hands and won't speak. Lucina said to Aria in a low voice, the man is apparently suffering from some illness of the spirit. He looked at the captain and said with hesitation, um, I'm a physician. I should like to see your master. The captain's face brightened. It was evident that he loved his master. Wait, master, I'll arrange you to take you aboard, for truly, I'm afraid that death is approaching. It was difficult for Lucan and Sonaria to board the other vessel, for the Two ships leaped restlessly, but not in tempo with each other. The captain received them like kings. Oh, God is good. My master will not die now. Never had Lucanus been so in such a wonderful ship. A Roman Augustale, or even a Caesar, would have been proud to own it. The decks were of teak wood, the walls of ebony, inlaid with artistic patterns of flowers 
and leaves of pearl and gold and silver. They gleamed in the hot sun. Lucina said to the captain, You are Jews, I say, for I observe no statues of the gods, no murals of animals. What's your master's name? Hillel bin Hamram, said the captain, and looked at Lucanus and Aria, expecting their awe. Well, surely you know this family, for not only is it the richest in all Judea, but it is a family famous for its doctors and lawyers and learned men. And my master is a friend of Pontius Pilate himself. And King Herod Antipas is flattered to receive him as a guest. Lucina smiled faintly. Young Aria was listening with interest. Lucina motioned to him. Let's go to our patient. They were conducted down to other decks, each more lavish than the last and full of light and precious fabrics and woods and furniture. You understand that my master owns no slaves. It's against the principles of devout Jews. Lucanus couldn't help saying with a gesture indicating Aria, you're very learned, my captain about the names of those renowned in Israel. Surely you recognize the son of Eliezer ben Solomon, who's been touring the world in order to perfect himself in the arts of medicine. Aria blushed. Lucanus was enjoying himself. The captain's eyes bulged as he looked at Aria. The son! of Eliezer ben Solomon, but his son was stolen from us when he was a child and was lost. He was lost, but has been found. Come, is this your master's door? Speechlessly and staring at Aria, the captain opened a door concealed by gold brocade, and the physicians entered so lavish in its eastern magnificence that they were dazzled. Curtains of silver brocade swung from the windows. Persian carpets covered the floor. The deck heaved and swayed, but the great gilt bed was bolted, for it was bolted firmly. And in it, under rich silken coverlets, lay a man of not more than twenty-nine. His face was like worn marble. His eyes were sunken in large circles like bruises. He appeared not to breathe. His black hair lay like a, lay like a flat fan on his embroidered cushions. His features were fine and austere. When Lucanus and Aria approached him, he didn't stir. Hillel ben Hamran, said Lucanus, gently bending over him. I'm Lucanus, a physician, and I've come to help you. And I am Aria ben Elazier also a physician and your countryman, said Aria with deep compassion in his voice. The sick man didn't move, it was as if, as if he'd already gone beyond hearing. Then Aria appeared to be listening. He put his hand on Hillel's cold forehead and said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Hillel remained motionless. The two physicians watched him anxiously. Lucanus lifted his slack and icy hand 
and felt for his pulse. He put his ear to the almost breathless chest. The heart was slow and feeble. When Lucanus looked up again, he saw that slow tears were seeping from under the shut eyelids. Aria sat down beside Hillel and took his hand and held it strongly. And Lucanus was struck by the beauty of the picture of this handsome young man silently comforting his brother. The sun poured through the window and lay on their faces. Don't weep, said Aria, for God is with you, and we will help you with this power. The tears poured faster from under the eyelids. Aria believed that the fingers of the sick man tightened on his own. He said, I was lost, and he found me. I was a slave, and he delivered me. I was a stranger, and he brought me to my people. Blessed is he, king of kings, for nothing is beyond his power. He shall not be silent when his children call unto him. Hillel groaned. It was if the sound rose not only from his flesh, but from his spirit. He didn't open his eyes, but he whispered, It is too late. He called to me, and I turned from him. I didn't forget him, and one day I knew I could not live without him. But what he asked me, was very arduous. So I went seeking, man, seeking him again. It was too late. The Romans had killed him, had nailed him on a cross like a criminal. Lucanus darted violently. He caught Hillel's emaciated shoulder in his hand. The soft silk rustled under his fingers. When was this? Hillel didn't reply for several moments. It was as if he had fallen into the sleep of death. Then he said faintly, It was at the Passover when the earth darkened. Lucanus sat down abruptly. His heart was leaping and there was a thundering sound in his ears. He pressed his hands to them to clear them. After a little while, he reached mechanically for his pouch and brought out a vial which contained a stimulant. His hands trembling, he poured a little into a goblet of wine which stood on a table of lemon wood at the sick man's elbow. He held the goblet to Hillel's lips and cried peremptorily, Drink this. Then you must tell us, for this story is what we've been seeking. Hillel drank without opening his eyes. Then Lucanus let his head down on the cushions. The radiant sea threw glancing shadows of light into the chamber. Gulls cried near the windows, and the voices of many seamen echoed on the wind. The hot odor of tar and salt and fish was mingled with an aromatic odor like myrrh. Lucanus and Aria waited for Hillel to speak. A faint color began to creep over his ivory cheeks. His ashen lips quickened to coral, and the sweat dried on his brow. Then he opened tragic eyes, and they were dark and tormented. 
you seek him, but he is dead. I saw three crosses, tiny and diminished, on the far place of skulls, against a turbulent sky of pink and lilac clouds huge and boiling and there was an awful light upon the earth the people told me where i stood that one of those on the crosses was jesus of nazareth and that he had been condemned for flouting the law and causing insurrection against rome and while i stood the sensation of dying and loss in me. The sun withdrew his radiance and the earth shook and the people fell on their faces with a sound of great terror and mourning. I was too late. Too late forever to tell him I would follow him. And then, said Luke Ennis, as Hillel fell silent, turning his head in anguish, the sick man made a feeble gesture. I don't know. I fled that accursed place that night and I went to Caesarea. I remained for a few senseless days and then I fled to the sea for nothing was to be worth anything any longer. The ancient prophecies say that he will rise again. He strained towards Hillel, who shook his head. How is that possible? Yes, it's true that I heard from my servants that so his followers had declared at the end he was only a man. He looked at Lucanus imploringly. He died. You must tell me for my soul's sake and peace that he was only a man after all. And then I didn't truly betray him, nor wound him. Have not men always betrayed him? And will they not always betray him? World without end. Didn't I betray him myself? Though I saw the star of his birth, and I heard of him from infancy. You repent, and penitence is all that he asks. Hillel was weeping. Then, I, I, I am not lost, and, and he has forgiven me. He will not despise a repentant heart, said Lucanus and wiped the sick man's cheek with the towel dipped in cool water. But tell us. It was some time before Hillel could speak. He twisted his thin fingers together and looked at the shining windows as if seeing something beyond them. I had been visiting Herod who is a friend of my family in his place at Caesarea. You'll understand that was almost a year ago. I, my wife and my children who are with me also, but as the time of the day of atonement approached, I couldn't remain with Herod. It was partly Greek and a man of caprice 
who is at one hour a Greek and then the next hour a Jew. I'm not a pious man, nor do I observe the strict law. Nevertheless, I could endure Herod's conversation no longer, nor his moods. He sacrifices in the Roman temples. Then he goes to Jerusalem for purification and strews ashes on his head and cries for forgiveness and heaps gold in the hands of the priests. So I sent my family to Jerusalem quietly, then followed them a day or two later. He paused and Lucanus refreshed him again with the wine of the stimulant. You must understand that I'd been hearing much about this Jewish rabbi who is teaching the people in the dust of the cities and the byways. Herod spoke of him with uneasy laughter. There were many who accused him of arousing the Jews to rebellion against the Roman oppressor. But Herod was also uneasy because he had caused the death of John the Baptist as he was called by the people. For Herod is a learned man in his way and he thought that John was Elias and had at first spared him. John had denounced him, him the Tetrarch, for marrying his brother's wife, Herodias. You will understand, Lucanus, that these things are vague in my mind. For what was a poor Jewish rabbi from Galilee to the rich and the powerful. There are always prophets. The Jews breed prophets as locusts breed young. One more or less is unimportant. I should not have listened to any of the stories had not Herod seemed unusually capricious and disturbed. And had he not become unpredictable and savage since he had put John to death. I understand that Herod might have forgotten John as one forgets a violent colored dream in time had not that Jewish rabbi appeared in his footsteps. Herod told me that John had spoken of him. Then it was rumored that the rabbi was performing great miracles. The palace rang with the news. It was said he was the Messiah. It was strange that it was only the slaves and the miserable freedmen who spoke of him with such inordinate passion and excitement. But rulers listened to slaves. So the rumors of the Messiah came to Herod's ears and he was beside himself. Lucanus wiped Hillel's face. Aria sat in silence listening and Hillel did not release his hand. It was a hot day when I left Herod and I drove my own chariot surrounded by my servants on horseback and on foot. The dust was a white fire and I wrapped a cloth about my nose and eyes. And then at the roadside, we saw a little group of men sitting on stones in the dust near a small village and children stood shyly near them. Why did I stop? One of my men rode up to my chariot and told me vehemently that yonder there was the humble rabbi with his friends. And I was curious to see the man 
who had so ignited Herod and about whom there were so many incredible tales. So I drove up near him and his little band of followers and the children and listened with a smile to one who appeared as poor and humble as a beggar. And I said to myself, oh, is this is he who of whom they speak? He was telling his story, a parable. And the Jews were as full of stories as a pomegranate is full of seeds. His accent was gross, for he was a peasant from Galilee, a woodworker, as I was told. He related this story very well with much eloquence. I looked at his dusty face and his dusty garments and feet as he sat on the stone, and I was struck by the story. For he told of a, a Pharisee, and the Pharisees are very devout and rigorous men who defend the law as the legions defend Rome who went up to the temple to pray. And beside him was a dull publican of no consequence, who no doubt the Pharisee found insupportable. And the Pharisee fastidiously annoyed the nearness of the publican, drew his head cloth over his nose, so as not to be offended by the other's presence and his mean occupation. Hillel's eyes changed, became eager and warm as he looked at Lucanus. That it, it, it was a very interesting story and I don't like the Pharisees who annoy me with their excessive piety, which is only the letter and not the spirit of the law. I was willing to be amused. It amused me that this poor and ragged man could speak of the Pharisees who were a terror in Judea with their constant accusations to the priests that the people don't observe all the rituals properly. They're tiresome and dangerous, these Pharisees searching always for heresy. He panted a little and once again Lucanus refreshed him. He lay in his pillows and his eyes became dreaming. Ah, an excellent story. The rabbi said that the Pharisee prayed to God, saying, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not a, as a I'm not as other men, adulterers, extortioners, unjust and knowing nothing of your law. I am not as this miserable publican who shouldn't profane your temple by his presence. I fast at all the fasts. I give scrupulous tithes and Pharisee the Pharisee was very pleased with himself. But the publican struck his breast, weeping, wouldn't raise his eyes, and cried out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Hillel had so far recovered that he could laugh faintly. <laughs> And the rabbi said to his followers, I tell you that this publican was more worthy than the Pharisee. A and God comforted him, but didn't comfort the Pharisee. For he that raises himself shall be struck down, but he who humbles himself shall be exalted. I must 
tell you of that, Rabbi. The son was vivid, but his face, uh, it was more vivid, for his emotion was more than the emotion of any man. He sat like a prince on a throne, and one forgot that he was only a member of the Amoritsan on a stone. Sorry. He sat like a prince on a throne, and one forgot that he was only a member of the Amoritsan on a stone and that his feet were laved in the dust. He smiled like a father. He looked at his followers with blue and tender eyes. And they listened reverently. His beard was golden. His hands rested on his knees. He spoke like one endowed with authority. It was then that the children, ragged and barefoot, standing in the background, approached him shyly. While I'd been listening to the rabbi, their mothers had joined them, poor women, in rough striped garments with jars on their shoulders. They pressed their children towards him, peering about them humbly, as if begging pardon. And his followers said to them, Do not disturb the master and take your children away from him, for he is weary and must not be troubled as he speaks his wisdom. Hillel sighed deeply and closed his eyes. But the rabbi called to the children and held out his arms to them and said to his followers, Permit the children to come unto me and do not rebuke them. For of such as these little ones are the kingdom of heaven. And the children clamored about him. He sat on, they sat on his knee and wound their arms about his neck, laughing and embracing him. And he held them to him. And I swear to you that I was freshly moved. For I'm a father and I know the sweetness of children's kisses and love. The rabbi said to his followers, who not, does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall not enter within his gates. Hillel opened his eyes and again they were full of torment. I understood the rabbi though never had I understood him before. I stepped down from my chariot. I approached him. My servants called to the people who opened a passage for me. He watched me approach, and he smiled at me like one recognizing a brother, and waited. My servants shouted, Make way for Hillel ben Hamran, who is a man great in Israel, for he had the rule of a town, and his family is renowned, and has much gold. And the rabbi said nothing, only waited for me, though the people stepped back in fear. I stopped before him, close enough to touch his shoulder, and he gazed up at me in silence. I said to him, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He smiled at me again 
and said, and his voice was sonorous, Why do you call me good? No one is good, only God. You know the commandments, that you must not kill, steal, bear false witness, or commit adultery. You must honor your father and mother. I said to him, I've kept the commandments from my youth. He was silent for so long that I thought he'd dismiss me. He, the poor unlearned rabbi, with a vulgar accent. Then he raised his eyes to me and said in a thoughtful tone, you lack one thing, sell all that you have, for you are rich, give it to the poor, for then you shall have treasures in heaven. Hillel raised himself on his cushions and looked at Lucanus imploringly. Physician, you'll understand how incredible that was. Why should he have asked me to beggar myself? Lucanus looked at the ocean, which he could see through the window, and said softly, He asked that each man deliver to him that which he holds dearest in the world. And it's evident that you held your money above all other things. Hillel groaned and fell back. That's true. I understand now. I stepped back from him appalled. He saw my agitation. And he said to me very gently and in a low voice, Come, follow me. Hillel passed his hand over his face. He asked me to follow him, to be one with his homeless followers. I, Hillel Ben Hamron, I told myself this was madness. Then he turned to his followers and very sorrowfully said, How difficult shall it be for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? Then he stood up and began to speak again to those about him. And I returned to my chariot, and I drove away. Lucanus and Aria didn't speak. Hillel looked from one to the other pleadingly. I was educated in Athens and Rome. I'm a man of learning and power and influence and wealth. I'm a man of the world. I am Hillel ben Hamron, and I was asked to do the impossible. I understand. I understand how incredible that must have sounded to you. For I didn't myself berate and hate him. I did, I did, I did. When he took me from my heart's darling, and I didn't I vow to revenge myself upon him? I didn't know, as you didn't know, that he takes only to give, bereaves only to extend his comfort, blinds only that a man can see his light. Who am I to approach you, Hillel ben Amram? He indicated Aria with his hand. Who knows? Who can know the mysteries of God? He surrendered this young man into my hands after more than 20 years of searching for him. And I know now that when he gave me Aria, it was to deliver me from my hatred and bring me to him. Hillel gazed at him. He watched as Aria leaned his head on Lucana's shoulder. 
Aria said, blessed are we that he visited us. Lucina stretched out his hand to Hillel. I can see that you never forget him. You won't. He haunted your life and your dreams, and you couldn't flee from him. Rest and be consoled, for you have suffered much, and he has forgiven you, and he asks you only that you follow him and leave him never. Come with us to Israel. We will find him again, for surely he's not dead but lives. And that's the end for now. Isn't that a tremendous story? Now they are going to meet Dr. Luke. I told you at the beginning, what was that darkness about? You probably figured it out. It is the same thing that the Bible says happened when Jesus died on the cross for you and for me. All we need to do is say, Jesus, come into my life, be my Lord, and he'll come. He's the one and only savior of the world. Otherwise, doom and gloom may not be happening now, but will, unless you receive him. Do it. Ask him with your mouth. Jesus, come into my life. I want to know you. I want to follow you. And you'll have made the most important decision you will ever, ever make.